Coming up on Lawmakers, Governor Purdue's faith-based initiative passes the Senate. Legislators react to the governor's State of the State address. And a joint House-Senate committee discusses proposals to modify the HOPE scholarship. Those stories and more are coming up next. Live from Atlanta, this is Lawmakers for Thursday, January 15th. Here are your hosts, Gerald Bryant and Nwandi Lawson. Good evening, everyone. Also on tonight's broadcast, Georgia's district attorneys express their support for equal jury strikes legislation. And the governor swears in the leadership of Georgia's transportation agencies, but our top story tonight, the passage of Senate Resolution 560. The Georgia State Senate votes in favor of a constitutional amendment clearing the way for faith-based organizations to get state money to provide social services. Opponents think that could lead to school vouchers. The governor's floor leader says that's not so. The governor of the state is not promoting vouchers with this resolution. I'll tell you as a lawyer that if you wanted vouchers in the state of Georgia, if you wanted to take public funds and run a and pay them towards students going to a K through 12 private school, you would not need to amend the constitution of this state. It is allowed right now. All you got to do is drop a bill. The governor's not dropping a bill. I do not want vouchers personally, nor would I vote for it. Several of the senators opposed the Senate Resolution 560, which is part of Governor Purdue's legislative agenda, mentioned vouchers saying overriding an existing ban on state money going to religious organizations could hurt public schools. Now there's been a discussion as to whether this repeal of Georgia's Baby Blaine Amendment could lead to public monies flowing directly to religious schools and many of the school groups, the PTA, the GAE, the other groups, are very concerned with that, especially at a time when the state does not appear ready to provide adequate funding to our public school system. Attempts to amend Senate Resolution 560 failed. The measure got more than the two-thirds majority needed for a constitutional amendment. It passed 40 to 14 and goes to the House. Governor Sonny Perdue's pledge for no new taxes got a standing ovation from lawmakers last night. The statement came early in the governor's State of the State address. I'm submitting to you a budget that is responsible, balanced, and principled. It does not contain, nor will I allow, any new taxes. Now, the State of the State address was carried live here on Georgia Public Broadcasting last evening. The governor also got good response for his support of child endangerment legislation. Georgia remains the only state without a child abuse felony law that has real teeth. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to change that this year, aren't we? Governor Purdue says he's backing a measure to take driver's licenses away from disruptive students, and he repeated his intention to raise teacher pay. My budget includes a 2% pay raise for teachers, and for veterans teachers, there will be an additional increase. In total, my plan will give a 5% pay increase to nearly 75% of teachers statewide. Also last night, the governor unveiled part of a billion-dollar bond package that's part of an effort to build a stronger economy and create jobs. Our state may not have a lot of cash right now, but we do have an excellent credit rating, and interest rates are low. So, just as many families are refinancing their homes so they can invest these savings elsewhere, now is an excellent time for us to invest in Georgia. My budget includes a $1 billion investment in the future of our state in the form of a bond package for transportation and other economic development investments. Governor Purdue says that the HOPE Scholarship Program will be around for a long time to come, and he's dedicated to improving the state's SAT scores, and he thinks that could be tied to HOPE. I believe that we should include an SAT component to HOPE eligibility. Georgia must improve our SAT scores. 
I'm not satisfied, and I certainly hope you're not satisfied, with 50th place in the nation with SAT scores, and I'm determined to get Georgia's SAT scores out of the basement, whatever it takes. Also in the State of the State Address, the governor called for a $15.3 billion budget for fiscal year 2005 that would include 65 new caseworkers for the Department of Family and Children's Services. The Peach Care Health Insurance Program for children would be preserved, and the governor says he wants to see ethics reform this session. House and Senate members had mixed reactions to last night's State of the State Address, though there were a few points both parties could support. Other issues like linking the SA2 to the HOPE Scholarship fell along party lines. Well, I think it was a good speech with the right priorities, talking about children and families and, and kids and all the things we need to do to help them and protect them. I can't wait to see his budget in more specific terms. And, of course, the one area that we disagree on is putting SAT standards on the HOPE Scholarship. The people have clearly said to him, we want you to cut spending first and not raise taxes while you balance the budget. That's exactly what he's going to do. He has presented a balanced, balanced, responsible, and principled budget that's based on his uh, conservative principles of cutting spending first and not raising taxes. I just uh, don't have a lot of confidence in this approach to suddenly uh, uh, attach a lot of weight to one single score. I don't think that's the way you raise SAT scores. I think we need to be putting extensive resources uh, and innovative, creative approaches in education from the ground up, from uh, prenatal care right on up through early childhood development and supports for families, paying teachers adequately and putting the personnel in our schools and staffing in a way and having curriculum. And It's a long process. You don't turn around SAT scores overnight. I don't think that changing the high school grade average to get in is going to make a lot of difference. I think our students will work harder. I think they'll do a better job. I don't think it'll decrease the number of Hope Scholars. I think checking uh, a Hope Scholar's t uh, grades in, in college sooner will eliminate very many. I think they'll work harder and they'll keep their grades up. The lines are going to cross here in the next couple of years, and we have to take action. To ignore that, I think, is to be foolhardy and to maybe put the Hope Scholarship in danger, and we're not going to do that. There are some areas that we, we, we're going to have some uh, serious discussion on, and uh, as it relates to Medicaid, maybe as it relates to Hope Scholarships, and uh, uh, other areas we agree upon, uh, such as peach care and pay raise uh, for teachers. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, we're just in the posture of trying to see where we are and uh, digest this budget and go from there. Secretary of State Kathy Cox delivered the Democratic Party response to the State of the State Address. She took exception to the governor's proposal to link HOPE scholarships with SAT scores. Under their plan, Students, no matter how good their classroom performance, could be shut out of the HOPE program. Those changes would fall particularly hard on rural Georgia counties. Experts tell us that in rural counties, like Decatur County in southwest Georgia, where I come from, thousands of bright young students with excellent grades could be denied the HOPE scholarship they've worked so hard to earn. Secretary of State Cox said she, like most Georgians, has a deep faith in God, but she urged caution in adopting Governor Purdue's Faith-Based Organizations Initiative. And so we applaud any measure which assures that faith-based organizations can carry out their vital work. But we should exercise care to ensure that this amendment does not produce unintended consequences. Let me tell you something. In other states, these faith-based measures are being used as a wedge to open the door to private school voucher programs, programs that can weaken public education at a time that we can least afford it. The Secretary of State said Democrats agree with the governor's teacher pay raise, calling it well-earned, but she said Democrats do not favor many of the proposed cuts to education spending. But mind you, we could not support cuts to education that have been mentioned, such as reductions in programs that help those students who need it the most, or cuts in textbook allocations, or cuts in funding for cafeteria workers and school bus drivers. A little truth in advertising is necessary here. Cuts in education that merely shift the cost down to local property taxpayers are something Georgia Democrats cannot support. Coming up next week on Lawmakers, we'll have an in-depth interview with Lieutenant Governor Mark Taylor about his priorities for the session. That's Tuesday, January 20th at 7 p.m. 
This afternoon, the Hope Scholarship Joint Study Commission, with help from the Carl Benson Institute of Government, gave a detailed presentation of their findings over the past year. David Zelsky is live from the Capitol with more on their plan. David. Well, thanks, Gerald. Several members of the commission had different opinions on what should be in the final report. For instance, the governor's plan to link the SAT with a student's GPA. But the proposals shown today were what the bipartisan commission could all agree on. The two major changes include payments for books and university fees beginning next year and implementing a standard 3.0 grade point average requirement statewide, effective 2007-2008. They weren't uh, things that there was a lot of, uh, you know, debate over. And so we wanted to bring just a solid common ground approach to the legislature and then let the legislature work out all the uh, issues with regard to you know, more political issues. The governor agrees with much of the commission's plan, but does want to add a link between GPA and SAT scores with hope that Georgia's scores will rise. We are not 50th in the nation in the SAT scores. There are only 27, 23 states that use the SAT as their primary, uh, you know, uh, uh, graduate high school uh, uh, test. Uh, you know the state that's number one? Uh, is uh, South Dakota. You know how many students took it in South Dakota? 197. But I think overall the commission did a very good job and we recognize that this is a start and it's not a comprehensive solution but by doing this we preserve hope at least up until uh, 2008. It's temporary but um, you know everything's going to be temporary because we can't project 10 years down the road and so we just have to do the best we can with the information that we have at the time. Lottery revenue to Fun Hope has increased every year, but that could change soon. Border State Tennessee begins their lottery next week, with South Carolina not far behind. Reporting live, I'm David Zelsky for Lawmakers. Thank you very much, David. House Speaker Pro Tem Representative Bose Porter was instrumental in the adoption of the Hope Scholarship over a decade ago. Today, he weighed in with his opposition to the governor's proposal to link Hope to SAT scores. The basis of Hope is its own achievement. If you work harder, if you put your gut into what you're studying, if the teacher spends a little more time with you to improve where you are, that you've earned something. Uh, I've just left the hearing from the Joint Commission, which was bipartisan, and it was not a recommendation of this commission to put the SAT on. By putting on the SAT, you select one test that doesn't have anything to do with achievement, and it changes the entire direction of hope, which is why we're so opposed to it. Now, the governor, of course, is pointing to the idea that perhaps this would, in fact, raise the SAT scores here in the state. How do you respond to that? Well, I just don't see how it can. Either you're going to do well on the SAT or you're not. Certainly, I think people are taking it very seriously now. They're taking prep courses. And it's, it, it's disparaged. Uh, there's disparity among the state. If you were from a rural area of the state, historically, you have not done as well. So it shouldn't matter on where you're born or or what your background is or what your opportunity for education in the early grades were. If you work harder and maintain a B average and you go to college and you continue to work harder and maintain that B average, you should earn it. And it's done on achievement. And that's the whole basis and thrust of hope. And by putting it on one test with SAT or any other one test, it changes the entire direction and merit of an achievement-based a scholarship. Well, switching gears a little bit uh, and still staying with that budget, the governor, of course, announcing that one billion dollar bond issue that he's planning. How do you see that as a as a potential revenue ma uh, revenue raising source here in the state? Well, of course, we've been uh, very supportive of capital projects, especially where those needs are in education. Uh, you've got to keep pace in your university system and your technical adult schools. We have a tremendous increase in enrollment for those going back to technical colleges. In other words, when the textile industry changes in the state, you've got to be re retrained for some other job, and you've got to have the facilities to do that. Uh, we have not seen a breakdown of that bond package. Now, it's interesting because I think uh, this government has been critical in the past of large bond packages, but here you have low interest rates, you have very competitive construction prices, the state would be a partner in helping spur the economy. Uh, I, I can't wait to see the breakdown of those bonds to see exactly what the impact is, but I would hope it would be spread evenly among the state in education opportunity, job training, uh, higher education, transportation, That's where, and uh, I think there is some for some green space. So I can't wait to see the breakdown, but 
but I think he's probably, as fast as, as the state is growing, uh, is probably something that would be good to do. As we reported at the top of our broadcast, Governor Purdue's faith-based initiative passed the Senate today. I asked Senate President Pro Tem Eric Johnson how that proposed constitutional amendment might fare in the House. I think it will be okay in the House. The House has already uh, engrossed the, uh, their, the House version of it, which is exactly the same. Um, and I think if the House were going to play games with it, they wouldn't have done that. Um, it, when after we did all the debate and all of the um, the, the crying and, and pointing at, at you know these liberal boogeymen behind the trees, it passed fairly overwhelmingly in the Senate, and I think the same thing will happen in the House. And by being engrossed, they'll avoid all of the debate on whether this is a voucher bill or whether this is a discrimination bill or any of those other side issues. Well, let's talk about that voucher issue. Most of those who were offering amendments or who were arguing against the bill said that it would lead to school vouchers, and if you were for vouchers, vote for it, but if you're against vouchers, oppose it. Um, several people on the Republican side said the governor had no intention of this leading to vouchers. Your take on that? That's what, that's what he said. Uh, you know, we have a lot of uh, people in the, uh, in the Senate that are in favor of vouchers. The governor and the amendment have nothing to do with it. It was all about um, local groups delivering better services to the neediest people in our neighborhoods for less money and with more compassion than the government bureaucracy. That's the bottom line. Probably the, uh, the biggest new information that came out of the governor's State of the State address last night was the amount of the bond package that he is proposing, a billion dollars for capital projects, for transportation, college buildings, uh, uh, enlarging ports, uh, etc. How is that going down on the, on the Republican and Democratic side? There seem to be some reservations by Democrats as to the amount of debt that the state might be incurring. Well, I've noticed the speaker has been supportive of that. I think if you look at last year where we did very little, plus the large one this year, combined over the two-year cycle, we're about average of what we, uh, what we put into the bond package. Certainly with a recession and an economy that's beginning to turn, uh, investing in infrastructure, invest, which it creates construction jobs immediately, it, it creates housing for our growing colleges. We're, we're adding a Georgia Tech campus every three years uh, to our school system. Our technical schools are bursting at the seams. Our traffic is, is, is backed up for lack of roads. So it's a, it's a good combination of investing in long-term infrastructure and providing jobs right now for Georgians. And finally, uh, a lot of talk about the HOPE Scholarship proposals, things that would prolong and save the HOPE Scholarship program. Uh, the governor still talked last night about wanting some link between HOPE Scholarships and SAT scores. Those are not, there are a lot of people in opposition to that. How is that likely to fare? Well, let's, let's remember the governor's proposal just links the two. He doesn't set a, a, a floor for you. It, 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 if you can, you could get a 500 on the SAT scores and still get hope with a B average. All he wants to do is the children to think about what their SAT score is as they, as they apply for the HOPE scholarship. I think there's a lot of hand-wringing and, again, in, a, in, 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 in politicizing of an issue between the lieutenant governor who plans to run for governor, uh, and instead of saving hope, some people are trying to destroy our university systems. Attorney General Thurbert Baker was among those attending a District Attorneys Association of Georgia gathering at the Capitol today. Lawmakers Chrissy Thrasher joins us live from the Capitol with more. Chrissy. In Wandy, it's legislation that would allow equal jury strikes for prosecutors and defendants in jury trials. And the District Attorneys Association of Georgia wants lawmakers to support Senate Bill 27. This group of district attorneys and law enforcement officials are at the Capitol to fight for legislation that promotes equal strikes in the jury selection process. Georgia is one of six states total in the United States where victims get less strikes than a defendant. And we're simply asking the legislature to recognize that a victim has rights to this bill. The District Attorney Association of Georgia says it's time for legislators to support Senate Bill 27. Uh, we're asking for strikes to be equalized to give the state a fair chance to cut down on the number of mistrials that cause victims to have to go back through the trial again. Currently in Georgia, the defense gets twice as many strikes as the state. And a lot of times uh, that causes an unfair advantage for the defense. And Senate Bill 27, which passed in the Senate last session. And I just want to say that I'm proud of the Senate and my colleagues for passing that legislation. So we want to support victims. And that's why we passed the bill in the Senate. Thank you. Would change the current law, allowing equal strikes for both the defense and the state. 
for trying to level the playing field, not on behalf of ourselves, but on behalf of the victims that we represent. And Senator Bill Hamrick introduced the bill last session. The bill is now awaiting action in the House Judiciary Committee. Reporting live, I'm Chrissy Thrasher for Lawmakers. Chrissy, who is supporting this legislation over on the House side? Well, in Wandy, Representative Mike Boggs will be handling the Senate Bill 27 in the House. Also today, Representative Victor Hill expressed his support for the bill. All right, very good. Thanks so much, Chrissy. Now, in last night's State of the State address, the governor said there is a transportation component to his Georgia Works Economic Development Program. Today, Governor Purdue held a swearing-in for four agency heads that he says will be instrumental in the program. Swearing in the head of the Georgia Regional Transportation Authority, Governor Purdue joked that the two of them used to compete to see who would arrive first at the Capitol when both served in the legislature. The governor said he was now counting on Steve Stansel to gear up a new transportation partnership. The governor said that I like to to get to work and get to the point. And yesterday our board came up with a new mission statement. We condensed it, we got focused because we want to improve our mobility and congestion, improve our air quality and improve our land use in Georgia. A former state representative, Stansel was appointed to head Greta last October. The mission of the department is to provide transportation choices and improve air quality in 13 metro Atlanta counties that are not currently meeting the Federal Clean Air Act. 34-year veteran of the Department of Transportation, Harold Lenincol, was appointed in September by the State Transportation Board. Doug Hooker was sworn in as Executive Director of the State Road and Tollway Authority, bringing six years' experience as the Commissioner of Public works for the city of Atlanta. The transportation heads entered into a memorandum of understanding, outlining a partnership between their respective departments. I think we've got some individuals here uh, who I believe are going to work together to uh, solve our traffic congestion problem, and that's, uh, that's what I'm looking forward to. I know that's what our citizens of the metro area are looking forward to. Jim Davis was also sworn in today as head of the Department of Motor Vehicle Services. Governor Purdue did not elaborate on the specifics of the new program, but he says he will have more information about the cost and the implementation in the coming weeks. A change to the way poultry farmers receive their products was defeated in the House today. House Bill 648 would allow three days to review contracts with attorneys before receiving shipments of young chickens. Opponents of the bill said producers are already covered by federal regulations and that the measure would be restrictive to business. I spoke with Mr. John Rawlins, director of the USDA Packers stock Stockyard Office in Atlanta, and he welcomes any complaints from growers, but this is what he told me. At this time, there are no complaints pending in Georgia regarding poultry contracts. Whether the grower knows this or not, I do not know. But I know when there is a problem, you usually deal with the integrator, and I did it on many occasions when I had a problem. And I think some of the folks, whether it's isolated in, in the chairman's district or in uh, Mr. James's district, I know there are folks that are not happy with the integrator. Fortunately, this, the four years I was in it, I stayed with the same integrator, knowing I could go to any one of them that I, that I choose to. I chose not to do that. In addition to the specific details of the bill, there, there is more important reason to defeat it. Over the years, Georgia has provided a positive climate for the development of the poultry industry. Poultry is now the state's leading commodity and the top agribusiness employer. Poultry is a $3.7 billion industry in Georgia. House Bill 648 did not receive a constitutional majority and was defeated by a vote of 87 to 72. The bill's sponsors have indicated a desire to have the bill reconsidered. Also today, the House adopted a measure to reduce truancy and absenteeism in public schools. House Bill 395 would make parents and students aware of the consequences of missing school. Representative Warren Massey questioned whether this would take away some parental choices. If a parent decides to take their child on a family trip somewhere, uh, how do they go about getting permission to do that without violating the, this piece of legislation? Well. As you know, the law says you've got to be in school now. So it won't be any different except uh, hopefully it'll be enforced a little little better. Now, under the uh, No Child Left Behind law, you've got to have 95% attendance or you're considered a failing school. So we've got to get those kids in school. We've got to plan better as parents. They've got to plan better. 
and try to take them when they are out of school. The measure does not apply to private or home schools. The House passed the committee substitute to HB 395 by a vote of 162 to 3. Governor Perdue emphasized the importance of the Faith and Family Service Amendment to the Hispanic community this morning. One of the, uh, uh, the tenets of your culture and heritage is reaching out and helping one another and not being afraid to use the faith-based institutions to reach and provide social services to our citizens. And I know that uh, your culture has strong faith. That's essentially what we're trying to do with our faith and family services amendment. And I hope that you all will uh, speak to your legislators while you're here today to encourage them to support our faith and family services amendment that will simply bring our Georgia Constitution in line with the U.S. Constitution, which will help to provide the best services from the best providers to our citizens in need. Those remarks made to the Atlanta Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. The Faith and Family Service Amendment did pass the Senate today. Several hours after the governor made those remarks, the governor's speech was part of the ceremonies declaring today Hispanic Appreciation Day at the Capitol. Actress Jane Fonda started the Georgia Campaign for Adolescence Pregnancy Prevention back in 1995. She was on hand today as GCAP held its annual legislative luncheon where she spoke out against proposed budget cuts to the Department of Human Resources Adolescent Health Programs. The cuts total over four and a half million dollars and would also affect youth development and TANF dollars. Fonda also introduced the keynote speaker, former U.S. Surgeon General Dr. David Satcher. It matters tremendously to businesses and to all of us, no matter who we are, whether we live in Buckhead and we run a big corporation or we live in South Atlanta and can barely get a job, it matters if your child grows up to be a doctor or a drug peddler. Communities have a responsibility to make sure that people receive the information that they need in order to deal with their sexuality. Uh, it, is, uh, it is unfair and unjust for young people not to be educated about their sexuality. For not to, and it's not a political issue, even though we make it that. It's about health, it's about human well-being. According to GCAP, teen pregnancy rates are at record lows across the country as well as in the state. However, Georgia still has the seventh highest teen pregnancy rate in the nation. Coming up tomorrow on Georgia Public Broadcasting, join us for a special presentation in the spirit of Martin Luther King Jr. 2004. That program will replace our regular lawmakers broadcast at 7 p.m. Be sure and join us for that special tribute. Lawmakers will return next Tuesday evening at 7 p.m. The General Assembly is in recess to consider the FY 2005 budget, and we will have an in-depth interview with Lieutenant Governor Mark Taylor. That's Tuesday at 7. Now stay tuned for Ask This Whole House. That program is next here on Georgia Public Broadcasting. And that's our broadcast for this, the fourth legislative day of the Georgia General Assembly. I'm Wandy Lawson. And I'm Gerald Bryant. For everyone here at Lawmakers, good night. Good night.